on the day after the attack in, in the MA, he preached a message, and that message was, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus is building his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We need to continue to preach the gospel, be more bold than we were before. Jesus is building his church, but sometimes he's building it through trouble and persecution. Earlier this year, dozens of churches were burned in the African nation of Niger. But as you'll hear this week on VOM Radio, even in the midst of such persecution, God's truth is marching forward. You'll hear fresh examples of that right now on the Voice of the Martyrs radio network. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help right now on the Voice of the Martyrs radio network. If you received the Voice of the Martyrs free monthly newsletter, you opened up your June issue to find a story about Niger, and in particular, a pastor named Musa Tinubu, forced to run for his life when radical Muslims attacked his church in Niger. We're going to hear more about the country of Niger this week on VOM Radio, and we really have an expert to guide us in the form of missionary Ron Childs. Ron and his wife, Jerry, have been missionaries in Africa for almost 40 years. They served first in Nigeria for many years and most recently have been serving in Niger. Ron, welcome to VOM Radio. Thank you very much. It's a great joy to be here. Uh, let's talk about Niger because, uh, you know, three years ago, we didn't even have Niger on our prayer map. We didn't talk about persecution in Niger. Uh, it was just sort of Nigeria's next door neighbor, and that's what we knew. What happened earlier this year that really made persecution a fact of life for Christians in Niger? Well, on January 16th, we heard that in Zinder, in the province of Zinder, in the city of Zinder, in the city of Gure, and other cities, there were attacks by Muslims destroying churches, uh, burning the homes of the pastors, and even the members of the church were being destroyed. And we in Niamey, uh, heard about this, and some of our pastors took precautions and left their homes to to stay in other places uh, on that Friday night. On Saturday, we began to hear rumors and see the smoke as uh, churches all over the city of Niamey were being burned, perhaps uh, more than uh, 40 churches in Niamey, uh, other institutions that were uh, Christian institutions were being attacked the pastors were were having their homes burned and this ha this was happening all over the city and the police couldn't do anything about it the the president seemed to think that uh, he was totally unable to do anything about it now you've been in Niger since 1993 have you ever seen anything like this before is this something you could have predicted would come or or how did you know, what were your thoughts when you first heard, wait a minute, this is Niger? Well, Niger, it has freedom of religion. And uh, some Christians as well as Muslims are in the government. And we didn't expect this at all. The, the Muslim people in Niger have, uh, I would say, tolerated Christianity and have not uh, really uh, felt threatened at all by Christianity. So this was a big surprise to all. What changed uh, or what led up to these attacks? Was there some significant incident that kind of sparked this? Or did it, do you even know? Does anyone know kind of how this got started? I think we didn't know. But I would say that in 2007, we had the first ever uh, citywide evangelistic meeting when Richard Roberts came and uh, many people, Muslims came, heard the gospel, and got saved. Uh, since that time, we've had other evangelists come. The church is getting stronger. The churches are being uh, uh, expanded throughout the city, and I think this is the reason Muslims are beginning to take 
uh, knowledge that there is a church, there is a Christian presence in Niger. So it really is coming about because the church is growing, because non-church people see the church growing, they see people coming to Christ. This is the truth, yes. And um, some of the people who were working in government places alongside of the Muslims never really made their Christianity known. And so when this happened, now all of a sudden people are seeing, okay, there are Nigerian Christians in our in our, in our offices, in our government, but uh, they didn't realize this before. What is the basis of your work in Niger? What what kinds of things are you doing to evangelize and to build the church? What kind of what is what does your work look like? When we first went into Marathi, we felt we will go into the villages. We will go to where there's no church, and we're invited. And we go and we'll preach the gospel where where we are invited. And as a result, we have now about 20 churches in the Marathi region and about altogether 36 churches. And they're all being pastored by people who were formerly Muslims uh, and are now uh, saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and really uh, building the church. We are on radio. We have Christian primary schools. We have three Bible schools. And as we uh, get people saved. We we disciple them in, in a discipleship course, and then we train them in leadership, and they're pastoring the churches now. When you went into the village, um, what were the people like as far as openness? Were they really accepting of the gospel? Were they kind of standoffish at first, or uh, what kind of what was the soil like that you were planting the seed in? Well, you have to remember that Niger is a very needy place. The people are uh, impoverished. And so when we go in there and preach the gospel, they think they're going to get something good. They're going to, they realize maybe we're going to give them uh, food. Maybe we're going to help uh, them financially. When uh, we build a church, the people are uh, excited about Jesus and some of them get saved and some of them go away. But uh, they all say, yes, we want to follow Jesus. And we've been accepted in most places. One of the things you mentioned is is being invited to the village. Tell us a little bit about that and uh, who invites you and then what kind of protection does that provide? I'll give an example, a little village called Tamroro where one of the young men wanted uh, us to come in and do a Bible study. And so we came in at his invitation and went first to the chief of the village. And the chief said, yes, we welcome you. Come and it started church. So I preached, and about 25 people said they wanted to follow Jesus. And a month later, we came back and showed the Jesus film. And uh, we started the church, and the, the Magri said, you can use this uh, storage facility as a, a initial home for the pastor to stay in until he can build his own. Wow. <laughs> so they threw out the welcome mat. They, very, they really did. In fact, we've had about uh, four or five men come out of that village who became pastors. You're listening to Todd Nettleton on the Voice of the Martyrs radio network. So then what happens if if somebody in the village is mad that you're there, say uh, uh, the imam or, or somebody says, wait a minute, why are you letting these Christians come in? or even comes to you and says, hey, you have no business here, go home. Yes. The, well, the people will be uh, supported by the Megri. The, the chief will say, I gave them cover. They don't have to leave. I protect them. So that, that the word of the chief carries a lot of authority. It does. So <laughs> what do you do to earn that good word or to meet the chief to get that permission? Do you just go to him and ask, and it depends on what his... Uh, response is, or is there a way to kind of make well, that happen? Well, more or less, that's it. If the if the chief is looking to uh, benefit his people in one way or another, he, he'll invite us to come in, and uh, we've always blessed the people in one way or another. What has happened since the attacks in January, as far as the churches that were burned, and, and I know the pastors were threatened, uh, what has been the the situation for the churches since then? Well, on the day after the attack in, in the MA, on the 
in a church that I attended at ICF, the International Christian Fellowship, which is uh, the pastor has been working with me for 20 years. He preached a message, and that message was, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And uh, we have no need to fear because we're in Christ. And we need to continue to preach the gospel, be more bold than we were before. As a result, I would say the church is now um, going to be stronger than it ever was. We're going to rebuild our buildings because that will be a sign to the unbeliever that we're here and we're going to stay here and we're going to change this nation by the gospel. I know part of your ministry is is training pastors and training leaders. Uh, did you did you have any leaders that that came to you after these attacks and said, kind of fearful? Well, what do we do? Should we stay? Should we hide? Um, or did they all kind of respond the same way that pastor did and say, "Hey, this is great. Uh, our work moves on." Well, the ones that I interviewed, they've they've also had the same response: is that. Uh, you know, we trust God and we're going to go on and the church, Jesus is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And uh, they're encouraged. How, what has been the response of the government since these attacks? Uh, did the police protect any of the churches? Did they arrest any of the culprits? I believe that some arrests were made, but uh, there's not much the government can really do. Uh, they've said they were sorry, they weren't prepared, they weren't able to protect us, and uh, they want to help us. They took a survey of what was needed to restore churches, and they say they're going to help with finances. Uh, I'll, I'll rejoice when I see it. <laughs> what uh, I, I know you've helped us, VOM, to respond to some of this. What has been some of the ways that VOM has responded to help out in this situation? Well, when I met, he said uh, in Guinea they had helped uh, pastors that were burned out with so much money, which represented about uh, a year's rent on a home for the pastor. So we found that there were about 34 churches or pastors that had their homes burned out, their, 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 his, their things looted, removed, so they were in need. And uh, so he, he suggested that we we do compensate them with uh, uh, an amount that represented a year's uh, rent in a home. And so what does that mean to those pastors uh, to, to have that uh, blessing and that support? Well, they were overwhelmed and, and, and enjoyed uh, receiving that money. I know uh, they were very thankful and they wanted to say thank you to VOM for that. As you have been first in Nigeria, then in Niger, you've obviously worked among Muslim people. What do you find is the key to sharing the gospel with Muslims? By, by sharing the truth, the pure gospel, that Jesus is the Son of God and that he gives life and life more abundantly. And we don't, we don't hide. We uh, let them know this is, this is the gospel. And... Uh, we have Jesus, and Jesus will change your life. Do most Muslims come back and argue with you about that? Hey, no, Jesus was just a prophet, and he wasn't even the last prophet or the best prophet. Or do they? how do they respond when you come at that with that basic gospel message? Well, some will receive your word and some will not. It goes either way. But uh, we never use um, the Quran. We never talk about Islam. We never talk about Muhammad. And uh, we just want to uh, preach from the Word of God, the Bible. So would you advise, you know, because some of our VOM radio listeners will have, you know, Muslim coworkers or they'll be at school with, with Muslims, is that the same approach you'd advise? Simply tell them the truth of the gospel? Don't, don't try to debate with them. Don't get involved in what's in the Quran or what's not, but simply tell them the truth? Well, I, I have never tried to, to debate with a Muslim. If they're interested in, in my testimony or the word that I have and they see how God has changed the lives of the people in our churches, many of them respond because they see the, the benefits. It is an abundant life that Christ gives. 
One of the things that we see often in the Middle East among Muslims is uh, stories of miraculous things, dreams and visions and things like that. Are you seeing that in Niger as well? It is true that many Muslims will come to Jesus because of a vision or a, a dream. It, it, it is common. And do you have any explanation for that? <laughs> well. Other than, <laughs> other than God's doing his thing? <laughs> God is doing his thing, all right, that's for sure. I, I think that uh, it's like when Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And uh, there were different answers given. And then Jesus asked Peter, well, who do you say that I am? And he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, well, it's not by other men that you learn this, but it's by revelation. And so I believe that God reveals himself supernaturally to everyone, whether you be a Muslim or, or anything, whatever you are. It is a revelation that Jesus is alive and he wants to change your life. Boy, that's a great prayer request for, you know, people in Niger, but also for our friends and our neighbors that we want to meet Christ, that that the Holy Spirit will reveal to them that truth. Uh, Ron, as, as we're thinking about Niger, and we're thinking about Africa, and we're thinking about ministry to Muslims, but particularly with regard to Niger and the church there, how can we pray? Because we always want to equip our listeners to pray effectively for the countries that we're talking about? Well, it, it's really a prayer that the Holy Spirit will move powerfully through those who preach the gospel one-on-one -on -one or through mass evangelism. But most people come to the Lord through personal witnessing. And for the church to be bold and to go out and meet their neighbors and tell them, I'm a believer in Christ, and I want to tell you some good news. That's how they'll be saved. Ron Childs has been our guest, a uh, missionary in Niger since 1993, missionary in Africa uh, for 38 years. Ron, thank you for sharing your wisdom and sharing an update about what's happening in Niger. I've enjoyed being with you, and I do pray that Niger will be saved. Amen. And we ask our listeners to join you in that prayer, praying for Niger uh, and, and just praying especially for our brothers and sisters there. Thank you, Ron, for being with us. Thank you. You're listening to Todd Nettleton on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. You can listen to every episode of VOM Radio at www.vomradio.com. Net. My thanks to Ron Childs for being our guest this week and talking about Niger and his work there. We're going to share another story from Niger, and it's one that we talked about several months ago on VOM Radio. It's a story from other missionaries who worked in that country, Brent and Shelley Teague. There aren't very many Americans who can say they were attacked by Al-Qaeda and walked away from it. But Brent, you can actually say that. Well, I really shouldn't be alive. Um, it was May 11th of 2004, and I was going up to a village about 90 kilometers north of the capital city of Niamey in, in Niger, and I had a couple Bible school students with me and their families. Uh, we had three children in the car, and uh, these uh, uh, Al-Qaeda operatives were in another vehicle that came alongside our vehicle in broad daylight and opened fire with a machine gun through the driver's door. So the first bullet went through my knee, and then the second bullet went through uh, the shin of my leg. I just missed the uh, main artery by about a millimeter. So. Wow. But I was in pretty bad shape. Then they took us off-road. I got the car stopped. Then they commandeered our vehicle and followed in theirs and took us off-road and robbed us. And uh, at that time, they weren't kidnapping Westerners like they are today. They were carjacking, and then they were taking the cars and chopping them up and then reselling the parts to finance their their operations. Uh, things have changed a lot uh, today. and uh, But anyway, I ended up in the middle of the desert, and uh, I had no hope for, honestly, no hope for survival. Um, they discussed finishing us off, uh, but uh, the commander decided not to waste the ammunition. They thought I was going to die anyway. There were 12 other attacks that same year in that same area. I'm the only uh, per driver that survived uh, the, the wow. different attacks. 
So, but God just did a miracle. I should should be dead. I was laying in the desert praying, uh, getting ready to go to heaven when the Lord spoke to me and told me my mission wasn't over on earth. And um, uh, the miracle is, is that there was an anonymous phone call to the federal troopers office, the gendarme, gendarmerie in the capital city, telling them that I'd been shot, that I was in, critically wounded, and giving them my location where I'd been dumped in the desert. And the miracle is, is that that phone call came 30 minutes before I was ever attacked. Otherwise, they wouldn't have gotten to me on time. So uh, I don't know how God did that, but uh, it happened. It's one of those things. We don't have to know how. We just say, wow. Shelly, obviously, you weren't in the vehicle, thankfully. Um, how, what's your side of this story? How did you hear about this attack and the fact, hey, your husband is, has been shot. He's uh, badly, badly wounded. Uh, tell us what happened on, on your end of the conversation. The week before this had happened, our family had actually been traveling back and forth to this village every day. I was doing a teacher training for children's workers. So I had taken the day off with the girls. Our girls were still small at the time in elementary school. So we were actually at a recreation center playing with them. When the news came, there was a member from the church that came in and got me. And um, I remember I called the pastor that was in the same city where they said they had taken him and he was in a hospital there. And in West Africa, you never say over the phone that someone has died. And you generally say they're very, very sick. And so as I was asking about his condition, he's, they kept saying he's been shot and it's bad. It's really, really bad. And I would ask, is he dead? Well, it's really, really bad. So I didn't know if he was alive or not. But during that time and trying to figure out what to do, I, um, I just felt God speak to me and say, you're going to be back in Niger ministering. And that just gave me an assurance that God was going to take care of my family and the hope that my husband was going to be okay. And I remember calling my mom first and telling her what happened. And I said, pray for me because I need to call Brent's parents. And when I talked to his dad, his dad kept saying, is he alive? And I said, yes, he's alive. And he asked, do you know for sure? And I said, well, no, I don't have confirmation, but I have peace in my heart. God's spoken to me and he's going to be okay. And so God was speaking to you. You had really a, the voice of God speak to you as well out in the desert. Tell us that part of the story. Well, I was praying at first. I was really questioning God why he permitted me to be in the situation I was at. And then I realized I'm going to be seeing Jesus soon. I need to have a better attitude. And so then I just started worshiping the Lord and thanking him for saving me and for all he's done in my life and thanking him for the privilege of serving him. And then it's when I started praying for Shelly and my two daughters uh, that I heard this voice. I mean, it's like talking right here. And it was a question. God just spoke to me and said, who told you your mission on earth is over? And uh, it was just shocking. And then I just responded and said, well, Lord, if, if you want me to work and continue to work, I'm willing. But you're going to have to do a miracle in a hurry. Although I didn't know that 40 minutes before he'd already done the first miracle. After you recovered, and we won't go into the whole long story of recovery and some more, you know, miracles that God did to bring you back and back to health, did you feel a, a new sense of passion or a new sense of God's hand because you could have died? I mean, you, your ministry could have been over. Clearly, God has something that he wanted you to do. How did you respond to that? Well, I think the experience has really changed my perspective because when I was laying there at death's door, I realized at that point that what we spend most of our time searching after things, material things, uh, positions, and all those kinds of things really are temporal, and they're, they're gone just like that. And what really counts, the only two things that mattered to me when I was dying was my family and my relationship with the Lord and what I was doing for him. And I realized when I go to meet him, it doesn't matter what house I lived in or what car I drove or what clothes I, I, I have a habit of wearing. What matters is, did, did I respond to his will and did I accomplish the mission he had for me? And so it's like a second chance. And I got to think about what were some opportunities missed? What is the Lord? And so I really had a renewed and refined vision. And as a result of going back to Niger, in that area where I was shot, I'd been trying to get approval, permission from the chiefs and the villages along the Niger River to preach, and they'd been hostile and refused. Well, after being shot and coming back, when they saw me, they said, you shouldn't be alive. God's with you. And so they opened and gave me opportunity in village after village along the Niger River to uh, preach the gospel. 
That was Brent and Shelly Teague, former missionaries to Niger. You can listen to my whole conversation with the Teagues on our website at vomradio.net. When you go to vomradio.net, just type Niger into the search bar, and it will take you right to my conversation with the Teagues. I love the story of God's miracle to save Brent Teague. And as we close out this week's program, I'd like to share with you another miracle story. This one comes from the Voice of the Martyrs book, Extreme Devotion. Uh, This devotional is called Extreme Assassin Part One, and it's about an evangelist named Andrew in Bangladesh. The devotional reading starts out with Job 42.2, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. The evangelist, Andrew, stared into the gun, wondering why the man didn't fire. The assassin grew frustrated, then frightened, and finally he fled the room. The phone rang, and Andrew found himself talking to the man who had come to kill him minutes earlier. The Muslim leaders offered me a big reward to kill you, the would-be assassin explained. I rode across Bangladesh to come to your office. The reward was mine. I was ready to shoot. But I couldn't move my arm. I couldn't pull the trigger. The evangelist praised the Lord for protection. Andrew found it somewhat comical. So what can I do for you now? He asked. Sir, I still can't move my arm, and it's because of you. Can you help me? Right on the phone, Andrew prayed, and instantly the man regained full use of his arm. Astounded by the miracle, he returned to the evangelist's office and began to ask questions about this Jesus of whom the Muslim leaders seemed to be so afraid. The evangelist patiently explained the good news of Jesus' love, even offering tea to the man who'd come to kill him. After 45 minutes, the man prayed to receive Jesus into his own heart. The former hitman's ministry now is to destroy the works of the devil. To this day, he is a fellow missionary in Bangladesh. The devotional finishes up with this thought. Andrew was not a victim of his circumstances, and neither are you. If he had been shot, his death also would have been a witness, and so will you. Unlike the devil's schemes, God's plans for your life cannot be thwarted. That's a reading from VOM's book, Extreme Devotion. You can order a print copy of Extreme Devotion through the store link at vomradio.net. You can also have an Extreme Devotion reading sent to your email box each morning. We'll give you a link to sign up for that in the info about this episode on vomradio.net. I want to thank you for being with us this week on VOM Radio. I hope that you've been blessed. I hope you'll pray this week for the nation of Niger, as well as persecuted Christians in other nations. You can connect with us online at vomradio.net, listen to previous episodes of our program, and leave us your feedback or questions. We'll see you next week here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.